Hello, everybody. I am Vasilios Dimakopoulos, the Dean of the School of Engineering here in the University of Ioannina. And I'm very happy to welcome all of you to our spring lecture series, which will host truly distinguished speakers and will run till about the middle of May, covering a wide range of engineering topics. We are very proud to have a famous scientist, a passionate engineer, and a remarkable leader start this lecture series, Professor Ned Thomas. I will stop here and let Apostolos Avgeropoulos, the head of the Material Science and Engineering Department, take over and introduce our speaker. You can use the YouTube live chat to ask questions. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Dimakopoulos. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to introduce Professor Edwin L. Thomas, uh, who is the early night professor of material science and engineering in the material science and engineering department at Texas A&M University. Professor Thomas is a material scientist and a mechanical engineer, and he's very passionate about pro promoting engineering, um, leadership, and student design competitions. His research is currently focused on using 2D and 3D lithography, direct right and self-assembly techniques, for creating metamaterials with unprecedented mechanical and thermal properties. His group does 3D construction of periodic materials using both transmission electron microscopy and dual electron ion beam scanning electron microscopy techniques. He has more than 500 publications in peer reviewed journals, more than 45,000 citations, and an H index higher than 110. He is the former Dean of Engineering at Rice University from 2011 until 2017. He is the former head of the Department of Material Science and Engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology from 2006 up to 2011. He was named Morris Cohen Professor of Material Science and Engineering in 1989, and he was the founder and former director of the MIT Institute for Soldier and Technologies. Before joining MIT in 1988, Thomas founded and served as the co-director of the Institute for Interface Science and was head of the Department of Polymer Science and Engineering at the University of Massachusetts. He is the recipient of many awards, such as the 1991 High Polymer Physics Prize of the American Physical Society, the 1985 American Chemical Society Creative Polymer Chemist Award. He is the fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Uh, he has the Special Creativity Award from the National Science F F Foundation. He is the Inaugural Material Research Society Fellow. He is the founding fellow of the Division of Polymer Chemistry from the American Chemical Society. Um, he has got the American Chemical Society Award in Polymer Chemistry, and he has been elected to the National Academy, Academy of Engineering and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, both in 2009. Uh, he has written the undergraduate textbook, The Structure of Materials, and he has received a Bachelor um, in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Massachusetts and a PhD in Material Science Engineering from Cornell University. Uh, before finishing and introducing Professor Thomas to start his talk, I would like to say that he has two honorary doctorates. The one is from our university in 2008, and he has been given by our department. And the second one is from Technion University uh, in Haifa, Israel, uh, which he got in 2016. Professor Thomas, it's a very emotional moment for me to introduce you to start this talk. Uh, and thank you very much for accepting this invitation. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, my uh, uh, thanks to to the dean, Vasilos, uh, and to Apostolos for inviting me. Uh, it's a great uh, uh, pleasure to come and and uh, present this morning. Well, this afternoon for you. Uh, so I have a, I think, I hope, an interesting talk. I've never given it before, so this is the first time. Uh, but it's pieces of talks that I've collected together. Uh, hopefully to inspire you guys to uh, have a uh, think about engineering and in, in, uh, maybe in, in new ways. So uh, I've been to Yohan Nina, and as Apostola said, I've, I've received an honorary degree, and I appreciate that very much, and I enjoyed uh, seeing, uh, I think I've been to Greece and Crete a couple of times, uh, uh, Crete's part of Greece. In fact, Crete um, is part of my lecture, so we'll, we'll get to Crete in a little bit. So here's the uh, outline. I want to talk about the role of engineering in the university. I think all great universities have to have great schools of engineering. There, it, it's a 
uh, something that, that must be there in order for other things to thrive. Uh, engineers are not just people who build things and, and whatnot. They're thinkers, they're leaders, they're doers. They get things done. And then I, I have a little Greek here in my outline that uh, says Daedalus. And I want to tell you the story of Daedalus, at least a modern story of Daedalus. Uh, and it does involve Crete. Uh, so uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, I'm going to spend some time uh, alluding to high technology startups that come out of universities, usually come out of engineering schools at the university. And then uh, presumably a lot of you in the audience are wannabe or already are engineers and you've gotten some sort of an engineering education. You may be undergraduates, you may be grad students, you may be postdocs, young faculty. And I think I'll, I'll talk to a little bit to uh, how to educate what I, I like the adjective effective, not just being educated, but be effective in your education. So uh, I have to acknowledge all the jobs I've had. I started off as a young professor at Minnesota in chemical engineering. I went to the University of Massachusetts in polymer science and engineering. Uh, I was at MIT uh, a long part of my career for uh, in the material science and engineering department. Then I went to Rice University as Dean of the School of Engineering. So I was over uh, a leader over that department. And now I've transitioned uh, to Texas A&M. Uh, so Rice and, and Texas A&M are both in the state of Texas. And uh, the other schools are uh, up in the north uh, where it's a lot colder. Anyway, those, those schools have been very uh, important to my career and, and to my learning. And I, I want to share some of the things that are best practices from all of those places. And I wanted to start off by, by reminding you folks that what you know is that uh, this school of engineering uh, you're in is uh, relatively new and it's, uh, well, compared to say MIT or compared to, I don't know, um, Heidelberg or uh, uh, Padua or whatever, some of the Oxford, Cambridge and so on. Uh, but you do have a good basis for a school of engineering. And I put an arrow next to material science and engineering because that's my favorite department and I'm uh, keen on, on that particular brand of engineering. But I think having the other two departments and then more to come, I, I understand maybe in the not too distant future, a mechanical engineering department uh, to build and, and, and continue to uh, have more and, and better uh, engineering people at, at your university. So um, design. A lot of people uh, talk about design. Architects, certainly, you're very comfortable with the word design. Uh, so are mechanical engineers. Uh, they design engines and cars and airplanes and so forth. Uh, I have a, a question for you. What? Think a little bit about what the letters HPA might stand for. Um, they have actually have, have to do with people. And here's a design challenge that's a bit out of the ordinary. Um, the usual design challenge, if you're, say, freshman or something, they might give you a group of four. They say, OK, you four people are on a team um, and here's a box of things. It might have a motor in it. It might have some rubber bands. It might have a, a little bit of software, um, some glue, some ribbons, uh, you know, pieces of wood, uh, some screws. Every box would have exactly the same set of components. And then they would challenge you to design something that would do something. For example, I don't know, say a, a car that would roll the furthest down a hill or something. And you and all the other teams would be challenged to build this thing out of the components in the box. And that's usually called the design problem. And I certainly participated in that, both as a student long ago and as a teacher doing things like this. But I would say that's an academic exercise. That's not really design. People never going to ask you as an engineer, here's a box of stuff, build something. And there's 10 more teams with the same box of stuff building the same thing that was built last year and the year before that. No, nah, they're not going to do that. But education, sometimes we, we think, oh, this is a really great challenge for these kids to have this box of stuff and they're going to have to build something. Now, let, let's, let's try a real challenge. So um, back in 1959, there was a guy named Henry Kramer and he put up a 5,000 pound prize and his challenge was to do a human powered aircraft, HPA, human powered aircraft. 
So the aircraft has one engine and it's a person. So we humans, we can put out work from our arms and legs and backs and various kinds of muscle groups. And what the challenge was is to fly a two kilometer pattern in a figure eight, which meant you had to be able to um, steer the airplane, the human powered airplane around a figure eight course that was two kilometers in length. And actually that got done. Uh, people built such a craft and it did go. So now we, we come to Crete and uh, an MIT challenge back in the late 1980s was called the Daedalus challenge. And let me remind you that uh, Daedalus was uh, on Crete and he wanted to get off, he was stuck. Uh, and uh, he recruited his son Icarus and they decided to go to Santorini, which uh, I've never been there, but I, I, Apostolos, that's a good place to visit. So um, starting in Crete to go to Santorini, it's 120 kilometers over the Aegean. And now you've got to remember that this is an airplane piloted and the engine is a person, a human. So if you're going to design this, they don't give you a box of components and say, here's the aircraft, go ahead and build it. They say, can it be built? And then you say, well, how big is it? And nobody tells you because nobody's done it. Nobody knows. What's it made out of? Nobody knows. How much does it weigh? A good answer is not very much because you're going to have to power this thing. So if it weighs a lot, it won't even, won't even get off the ground. But if it's really, really light, um, how are you going to steer it? How are you going to direct it and so forth? It needs to be able to have some of its own power from the person. How big is the wingspan? How much lift area is there? Because if you move it forward and you have a wing, you can have vertical lift. How fast is it going to go? Nobody knows. How long is it going to take to go 120 kilometers? Well, if you knew how fast it was going, you could say, well, you know, if it goes 10 kilometers an hour, that's 12 hours, that's half a day. Hmm, maybe I should bring some sandwiches. Maybe I should bring some Coke bottles of water. Uh, how much and, and when in the year should I fly? When are the winds maybe the best from Crete to Santorini? Better research that. Have a bunch of people asking if I can do it any time of the year. Should I do it in July? Should I do it in December? Uh, how do I control the airplane? After all, this engine is the pilot as well, and they have to be able to steer it. And who's going to be the pilot? Uh, somebody strong, obviously an athlete, but what kind of athlete? Because there's no athletic events in the Olympics, for example, that, call, that is called human-powered aircraft. So you might say, well, do I want a, um, a marathoner? Do I want a soccer player? I want, what do I want, right? So, um, and do I want a woman or a man? And nobody's done this, so you don't know. So you maybe want to try both and see who's got the best stamina and power and how much power do you need and all these questions no answers and so uh it's a system of systems it's not a box of stuff that you got to build it's a complete unknown that you have to figure out so um here's a picture of the airplane that was built it's called daedalus uh top view uh, uh up at the top and the side view in the middle uh, you can see it's got a very, very long wing that's very thin, single wing all the way across. It's got a propeller in front, and it's got a tail in the back. This is the more details, and now if you look in the lower right corner, you can see uh, the MIT guys figured out how to spell Daedalus, all capital letters there. Uh, and if you looked at all these details, it tells about what is the... Um, material made out of it and, and so on. And as you can imagine, it's a lot of very light components. You're not gonna put any concrete or steel into this thing. Um, right in the middle of this slide, it uh, talks about the world records. They actually did the flight. Uh, interesting that the pilot, I'll, I'll tell you about Canellus in a minute. And if you, I maybe didn't pronounce his name quite right, but it's a Greek name, cause it's a Greek guy. Um, Anyway, this, this flight lasted just short of four hours. So 120 miles, 120 kilometers in four hours, 30 kilometers per hour. That's, that's not bad, that's pretty good speed. So here's a picture of Canellus. Uh, his last name is Canalopoulos. Canalopoulos, uh, 
he was uh, a cyclist. He wasn't a marathoner. He didn't play soccer. He was a bicyclist, a uh, long distance bicycle riding. So his legs were super, super strong. He had great endurance and so forth. But he was one of about four or five people that were training to be pilots because you not only had to have the endurance to be the engine, you had to have the smarts to be able to steer this airplane through wind, crosswinds and so forth to be able to get from Crete. And this picture is showing uh, the airport in Crete. They used the air base there to take off. They started from still, there was no ramp or you didn't go off a cliff. Uh, the rule said you had to go from a stop on a flat area. So he starts bicycling, the thing lifts up into the air. Four hours later, he gets to Santorini. Amazing, amazing. And all of this thing that's built is built by undergraduates and graduate students at MIT. Undergrads and grad students, mostly undergrads. And no, no plans. And this is not a kit. <laughs> this was one of a kind. So it, it had all kinds of interesting, I'm a materials guy. So it's got polyethylene terephthalate, carbon fiber, Kevlar fibers, polycarbonate, a little bit of steel, but only in the lift wires, the wires that go out to the tips of the wing, uh, balsa wood, nylon, aluminum. Um, it weighed 32 kilo, kilograms, 32 kilograms, not very much, 32. They were trying to get rid of as much weight and the wingspan, which nobody knew to begin with, was 35 meters. That's a big wing, <laughs> 35 meters, and weighed only 32 kilograms. And then, of course, Canelos sits in the, in the seat. There was a bicycle frame. And I mean, they, they thought about using arms. They thought about using people's legs. It turns out your legs are the best power source. OK. Now I'm going to change to another design competition. This was one that went on at MIT, and it had to do with something called the soldier design competition. And they had all sorts of challenges. None of them were about building weapons or anything like that. It was, how do you help soldiers? Uh, as you see here, they're out, in, they're out in the countryside. They're carrying all kinds of stuff. Um, infantry have to bring stuff with them wherever they go. So weight is a matter. So we came up with challenges, and this is a real challenge that was um, back in 2005. The Army wanted a uh, what they call a powered rope ascender. And when you see it, you'll understand what it is. But it's the idea that soldiers oftentimes have to climb ropes. And you know that's a skill, and if you're strong, you can do it. But now you're a soldier, so you're wearing a helmet, you're wearing a backpack, you've got a weapon, you're now carrying maybe 100 pounds of stuff plus yourself going up a rope. You're not going up very fast or coming down very fast. Well, unless you let go, <laughs> then you're in trouble. So um, they wanted a see if students could build, as it says here in green, a powered rope ascender that would lift and, and there was specifications. I mean, engineers get specifications all the time. So this isn't some arbitrary thing, just like Daedalus. It's 120 kilometers. That's the specification. And you use a person. Okay. Now, how you do it, up to you. This is for 250 pounds, 50 feet in the air, and do it in about five to eight seconds. So whatever this thing is, it's going to move 250 pounds in the air in 50, uh, 50 feet in, in less than eight seconds. The other thing, if you look down at the bottom here, it says this, this device cannot weigh more than 30 pounds. So the payload would be 250 plus the 30 pound device because the device goes up with you. And they'd like it to even be less than 30 pounds, maybe 20 pounds, okay? Be able to have a single person uh, do it. So here's the actual device. Um, it's called Atlas. There's another, <laughs> got Greeks all over the place in this lecture. Uh, Atlas Design, that, the, that was the name of the team. Um, and here's the specifications. They build this thing in the MIT machine shop. Uh, it was partly uh, building new components and buying off the shelf things like a motor and batteries, but they were able to build this thing in something like six or eight weeks. So less than two months. 
and no directions. This is not a kit. This is, can you do it? And here's the specifications. They finally came up. They measured what they could do. They had an acceleration of two thirds of gravity up. Two thirds the force of gravity going up. Pretty impressive. They can do the 250 load. They move at seven feet per second. So to get 50 feet is about seven seconds. That was between the five and eight that the army wanted. Uh, by the way, if, they, if you wanted to keep going, the students could go 600 feet up. That turned out to be a challenge. We had to find a building that was 600 feet tall to be able to show that later on. Um, the prototype weighed, weighed 20, uh, 30 pounds. And then the production, they, they went into business. They started a company. And the first one that they sold weighed only 20 pounds because they got better at figuring out how to make it a lighter design. So here's a, an old picture of me. That's, that's me over on the left looking young. Um, and these are the four guys, all undergraduates. Uh, they won this uh, competition, uh, soldier design competition back in 2005. Uh, they were all mechanical engineers. There wasn't any computer scientists in there, wasn't any material scientists, all undergraduate mechanical engineers. Uh, and I remember getting involved in the demonstration of this because uh, they were wanting to show that the device worked. And they, they were kind of worried about, well, if it didn't work, and I was worried about this, what if they get hurt, right? They're going up the side of a building and the rope breaks or the device breaks or something and they fall. And if they're 50 feet in the air and you fall, you get killed, right? So what we did is we negotiated with the MIT swim team to get into their uh, swim practice pool. And if you look in the middle of this, you'll see a guy, it's not very clear because this is old iPhone data. You'll see a guy going up and well, there he goes. And he goes up to the top and stops. And he didn't, if he fell, he was gonna fall in the swimming pool. So that was good. And uh, now he's coming down the rope. You can see uh, pretty good descent. He was wearing a helmet. I don't know if that would help them in the swimming pool. But anyway, this was the first demonstration in public of the powered rope ascender. So in 2005, there was four undergraduates. By 2011, they had a company with 35 people. In 2020, that company has over 200 people. And boy, do I wish I'd been a founder of that company because they're doing really great stuff. Here's uh, from their website, which I put down at the bottom. So if you want to look at this website, it's now called Atlas Devices, Atlas Devices, one word, dot com. And they have applications, certainly military applications, but they're also selling these things to all sorts of power companies. So when they have those big power lines that go across the countryside and you need to get up one of those towers, you don't have to climb the tower. They don't even have to build stairs into the tower. They can go up one of these powered rope ascenders. So they're doing great business. Okay, now back to being engineers. Hopefully you're getting excited about being engineers. So one of the things people think about engineering is, oh, okay, it's a lot of science, a lot of mathematics, equations, and so forth. And that's true. That's stuff you, you, you get taught in class. But engineering is a lot more than just equations and things. It's using those things to do things, all right? So engineers at the bottom here, you design it and you build it. And it sort of works or it doesn't work. And you redesign it and you rebuild it and it's better. And then you redesign it and rebuild it. And now it's a product and it benefits society. So. I have a definition of engineering, application of scientific and mathematical principles. Important word there, application, that is going to be a, does, what does it mean to apply? You design it, you manufacture it, you operate it. You do it efficiently, economically, and it's valuable to uh, society. So um, one of the things when I was dean, I was always talking to industry because they, they hire engineers. You guys will get jobs and go out there and work. And one of the things that schools should be paying attention to, Vasilos, is what does industry think of your students, your product, your, your universities produce people. And these people have educations and are they educated uh, in the right way so that they're useful and, and they can have impact on industry. And so what's gonna be not just a smart engineer, but who's gonna be a successful engineer, okay? 
And so you get a bunch of technical abilities and your job is to learn how to use those effectively. And effectiveness, bolded in red here, an effective person uh, has motivation. I would say one of the key words is determination. They do not give up. They try again, they get up, try again. Um, they're good on teams, they're good at communication. And I, my favorite phrase down at the bottom here is, make it happen no matter what. Don't give up, don't quit. Make it happen no matter what. So um, effectiveness, okay, there's a word, you know, that's effectiveness, is that an engineer? What, what's effectiveness, why is that? So here's a question. How many effective engineers are in Greece? No doubt there's a lot of engineers, but how many of them are effective? And how would you know? Well, I would guess, just like in the United States, the number of effective engineers is a lot lower than the number of engineers. And so part of the job of universities is to produce more effective engineers, not just engineers, but people who are effective. And how do you know when somebody's effective? You know, do they take the effective examination? Nah, there's, there's no such thing. But I'll tell you, and you probably know this already, if you turn out to be a pretty effective person and you meet somebody new, within a few minutes, there's this sort of magic communication that comes between the two people that they recognize each other. And you're kind of like, oh, I can work with this person. This person, she gets it. She's on the ball. She's, she's like me. We're going to be a team. We're going to get this thing done. Uh, so it's one of those things that you know it when you see it. So here's some pointers on being an effective engineer. I'd start off with ethics. You can't tell people that something works and it doesn't, right? I mean, people's engineers build highways, they build airplanes, they go to Mars, <laughs> And you can't pretend that you have something if you don't. You really have to have high ethical standards. And you've got to come up and you want to work on problems that are important, problems that society uh, needs solutions to. Engineering fundamentals, you know, the equations, the physics, the chemistry, very important. But not only that, applying those things. Uh, come up with solutions. Uh, Communication skills, business skills. So uh, if there are courses in management and business, it's pretty easy for engineers to learn that stuff. The opposite is not true. Your, your kids, your friends that are in the business school or in, in management schools, they're not gonna learn physics and mechanical engineering and material science nearly. I mean, they're, they're not even gonna try. So engineers can go both ways. Uh, business people, they need engineers to go forward. Uh, they can't do it on their own. Uh, I put down uh, risk taking. I think uh, engineers, uh, everything is a risk. I mean, this Daedalus business, even they spent millions of dollars in two years trying to build this airplane with no guarantee that, you know, it might not even go anywhere and gets off a creek, barely gets up and crashes and the end of the game but it made it to Santorini, a lot of risk involved. Um, there's, if you go on YouTube and search for Daedalus, uh, MIT, there's about a one hour video of the whole planning, building uh, some, some test flights where there were crashes, no one got hurt, but the airplane got hurt, it got destroyed, they had to rebuild it and so on. Okay, um, communication is usually pretty simple. You're a student, you wanna, talk to your boss, uh, it's a very simple situation, right? There's the student and the boss, boss being a professor. That's the org organizational chart for university. Now, if you're in industry, you're down, see the blue arrow at the right? That's you, you're the new engineer. You just joined a team with Joe and Mary. You're in the R&D arm of the engineering, which belongs to a whole bunch of different divisions which have presidents which report to the chief operating officer who reports to the CEO on top. So you're not likely to go see the CEO. And if you want to communicate to the CEO, you've got to communicate through well, one, two, three, four, five levels of administration. So one of the skills of engineers to be effective is to be able to communicate 
not only to your friends on the team who are fellow engineers, and that's easy to talk engineer to engineer, it's harder to talk up the chain of command because those people aren't engineers generally, and you have to be able to explain things and convince them that your ideas and concepts are going to be successful. So um, once a long time ago, I was a dean, well, actually not very long ago, three years ago, and um, I thought of myself as a leader, and I had a school of engineering that had eight departments. The undergraduate program was growing like crazy. It was Engineering is very popular in Greece as well. Ioannina is, is growing and, and flourishing. Um, I had a bunch of research proposals that were coming in that I had to work on. I had a bunch of faculty, uh, um, X and Y and Z are just numbers like, you know, 10 or 20. And the next day, uh, you have all these problems sometimes, faculty. The best faculty are being recruited away. And you're the dean, you're the manager. You, you can't let your star players leave. So you got to pay attention to them, right? And then there are faculty who are stars and their research is, is really successful. They're bringing in a lot of money. They're attracting students and they don't have enough space. They come to the dean and they say, dean, I need space. And so the dean is like, all right, I'll work, work on that. Um, there's always emergencies. I, I call them utter panic emergencies. You know, once a week, something happens that you're not prepared. You know, there's a water leak. There's, a, I don't know, power goes down in a building. Uh, somebody gets stuck on an elevator. What, you know, you never know. There's always something short term. And then there's long term things like, you know, you're going to have to give a presentation to the board of trustees and you need time to think about what you're going to say, how to summarize it and so forth. So being a leader, <laughs> it's, you're not on vacation. You're, you're busy all the time and you have to juggle things because these things uh, change. And, and at short, one day you're dealing with this and the next day you're dealing with something completely different. So how do you do this? How do you become an effective engineering leader? Communicate, communicate well and communicate constantly. Don't go silent. You know, If you don't get back to people, uh, if they don't know what you're thinking or doing, they're not going to help you. Uh, tell the truth. Uh, the truth is, is important, especially in engineering. You can't say we have something when we don't have something. Uh, if you've got problems, identify them. Uh, you have to keep switching what is your most important priority. It, it, things don't go, this is first, second, and third. Sooner or later, things are going to change and something else will be more important. Sooner or later is usually like daily things change. Uh, you have to make decisions. And a lot of times when you're making decisions, you don't have all the information you'd like. You'd like to have another report. You'd like to have some analysis so you'd be more confident about your decision. But there's no time. You have to sometimes decide with a lot of uncertainty, which means you have to have backup plans because you don't know what you don't know. And so if something doesn't work, you can't say, well, it doesn't work, we quit. No, <laughs> okay, that didn't work. What are you gonna do instead? What's plan B or plan C, right? Gotta be flexible. And then here comes my phrase, get it done no matter what. Don't give up, be motivated, be positive, work hard, succeed. Get it done no matter what. Okay, when I went to Rice University, uh, one of the things I liked, and this is a direct pitch to Vasilos, find a space, build it out, and fill it with a lot of good things. So at, at, at Rice, they have something called the design kitchen. And you say, well, a kitchen, I mean, that's where you cook food and that's in a house. What the hell is a kitchen They're doing it in engineering? Well, it turned out this, this building used to be a dining facility. It was a kitchen. And then they gave it to the School of Engineering because nobody else wanted it. So the engineers took it and we decided to make it into a super duper machine shop maker space. So a machine shop's a given. You got to have all the lays and drill presses and all that for sure. But then you need a lot of other things. And this 2000 square meters of space is for undergraduates to design prototypes, build things, start companies, 
to form teams, to work on real challenges. And nobody's giving you a box of things to build the same whatever. They're giving you real problems that come from industry, that come from societies. Rice is really close to the Texas Medical Center. And so there's lots of hospitals and hospitals have all sorts of interesting engineering problems. And if you can get good liaison with the hospitals, they can tell you, we have a problem. We don't know how to do this. And you say, well, I don't know how to do that either, but let me think about it. And then sometimes you can come up with an approach that sometimes is successful. And this is, you know, the kinds of, I call it real world. I don't want to do something that's already been done. So what, you know, you built something that's already been built. You're just copying something. That's, that's not real design. Design is doing something new, doing something for the first time, doing something that somebody cares about. They want the solution that you come up with. So in, in Houston, which is where Rice is, energy, but now sustainable energy, lots of high tech, lots of medical high tech. There's 48 hospitals in Houston. Houston's a great place to get sick, by the way. There's 48 hospitals, no problem. Uh, Houston also has NASA. You know, and NASA's been pretty busy lately going to Mars and stuff. And they have all kinds of materials problems. I mean, think about going to Mars. How do you do it? Like, you know, <laughs> Crete to Santorini is a lot easier than going to Mars. Uh, so this, this facility is dedicated to design build. It's dedicated to undergraduates doing things they don't know how to do yet. So here's a few pictures of things. It has a machine shop. A lot of maker spaces are just machine shops. You don't want just a machine shop. You want all kinds of other things. 3D printers for sure, but not one, 20 of 20 different kinds. Things that print metals, that print plastics, that print ceramics. There's even stuff that print human cells, right? You load it up with cells and you can make scaffolds for burns and things to, to treat people. So um, <laughs> it even includes a sewing machine. You say, what, sewing machine? Yeah, sewing machines are pretty useful, pretty useful. So at Rice, we, we had a whole bunch of things. The, the picture down on the right is a bunch of engineers working on a team, building something that's never been built before. We started off with engineering in the freshman year, the silos, freshman year, year one, right, right from the beginning. A lot of times schools start with engineering design in senior year. It's called capstone design right here, line three, capstone design. And there's nothing wrong with doing capstone design, except that for three years, you haven't done any DM design. And then as the students leaving, finally you get to design. No, no, put design up front, put it in freshman year, and then people will continue it sophomore, junior, and senior year. And by the time you get projects senior year in capstone, you create a huge problem for the professors because all the problems that they've been using for capstone design since forever, the students don't wanna do those. They're too easy. They've been done before. The students are used to solving things that have never been done before. And they started as freshmen and they know all about design and using uh, apparatus and building things with 3D printers and sewing machines and whatever it takes. And they don't give up. And you come to them and you say, oh, okay, this is the senior design project. And they say, that's been the senior design project for the last 12 years you've been teaching the course. We don't want that. We want to do something new. Come on, right? So then the faculty go, oh man, all right. These guys are, they're really something different. I, I, I used to be able to get away with just giving them this box of stuff and saying that was a design course. Now I actually have to work. So um, one of the things that also happens sometimes is departments cooperate, because if you're on a team, it's never a team of four material scientists or four architects. It's going to be one architect, one computer scientist, one material scientist, one mechanical, maybe two mechanical engineers. They're electrical engineers. They're going to be software and hardware people on every team. It's not going to be four people from the same department. So a lot of these departmental design things are not very good if they're only inside the department. So one of the things to do is make it school-wide design, school-wide. That means departments actually have to talk to each other. Faculty have to cooperate. It's very good. So um, I'm gonna go on and, and talk about, you know, things I've already said. Uh, you look down this list, you know, 
take the initiative. You have to make decisions. You don't know enough information. You, you wish you knew more, but you don't have time. You have to make a decision. Um, I underscore ethics, integrity, trust, and loyalty. You work hard with people you trust. You deliver for people that you're loyal to. The reverse is also true. If you don't like someone, you don't think they're worthy of your friendship, you don't work with them hard. No way. So personal relationships matter a lot. So relating to others is key to having a good team and a successful uh, outcome. Now, how do you do all of this, right? You know, okay, I've been talking about design stuff. Um, design and, and engineering and building stuff is not done in a classroom. Okay, so it's a skill and you have to learn it by doing it. So I love this analogy. You see the guy over there on the skis. So I'll ask you rhetorically, how many of you know, of you know how to ski? And some, some people say, yeah, okay. You look around, if we were in a real classroom, there might be, you know, half the, half the students might say, I know how to ski. And I'd say, well, okay, so then uh, how did you learn how to ski? Uh, you probably uh, picked up a textbook or you, you watched a YouTube video and uh, you, you read the directions and you, you went to a ski slope, you put the skis on, you, you looked at the manual and, and you skied, right? No, of course not. You don't learn how to ski that way. You learn how to ski by going to a ski school with an instructor, a mentor. And what happens? He has you put on the, on the skis and you fall down and you get up and you fall down again. And he says, do it this way. And you do it a little bit and then you fall down. And he says, well, no, this, you know, lean this way, pay attention to the edges. And he teaches you doing it, not reading about it, not watching somebody else on television do it. You're out there, you're falling down, you're getting back up. This instructor is, He's mentoring you, but he's a coach. He's pushing you. Get up. Come on. Try it again. All right. Do it faster. That's better. That's how people learn to do things. Design, build, same thing. You don't sit reading a book. Books are good. You got to learn those equations and stuff, but it's not sufficient. You got to get in there and, and you got to make mistakes. You're going to break stuff. Things are not going to work, but you learn from it. Just like in skiing. I don't think anybody learns how to ski without falling down, what, a thousand times, a million times? I don't know. I'm a lousy skier, so and I don't go skiing anymore. So uh, very important to do things. So here's another list of, of things, the skills about managing and communicating, uh, being creative and responsible and so forth. These slides are sort of repetitive. The, the words are taken differently and so forth. But as you read through them, you say, yeah, okay, I, I don't, I don't have never found anybody that disagrees with what's on these slides. It's hard though. I mean, you say, oh yeah, yeah, I should communicate. I should make sure I learn these things. And I want to make sure my team is diverse. You know, again, you don't want a bunch of people with one set of skills. You don't want even want people with the same age group. You want people that are very senior, that have been around, huge amount of experience. And you want some fresh kids that don't know what they don't know and don't know that something won't work and they try it and it works anyway, despite the fact the old guy said, oh, that won't work. Believe me, I've been around for 40 years, that won't work. The young guy shows that it does work, right? So you need um, different kinds of people on teams. Diversity is very valuable. So um, here's another thing about engineers. And this is a lot of people sort of think, you know, engineers are kind of introverts. They're smart. They know how to deal with equations, but that's it. You know, they're, they're individuals. They uh, don't get along with others. They're um, kind of shy. They hang back. Um, well, not all engineers are like that, but some are, and you can change, right? Don't, don't think that you're not able to communicate and so on. Uh, I know sometimes uh, like when I was, in the eighth grade, I ran for student government. Maybe some of you did. And I was convinced, I didn't want to run for student government, but some friends of mine said, oh yeah, I'll run. You'll get elected president of the student government. So I ran, I lost, I lost badly. I felt terrible. I thought, well, that's it. I'm never going to, you know, no, no one of this leadership stuff for me. That's, that's it. That, no, it didn't feel good losing. Uh, but it turns out, you know, don't give up. Uh, losing is experience. You learn. Why did you lose? And of course, being president of the eighth grade class doesn't 
matter in life. That's, that's not something that's valuable. But it, in a way, it was valuable. I failed, but I failed in a sense that I didn't fail to build something or be a good engineer. I, I just didn't get enough votes. And it was more or less a popularity contest, which has really no, nothing but social skills. So you engineers that think, well, I'm not a leader. I challenge you. You may be a leader. Don't sell yourself short. Try stuff. Take some risk. Okay. So how do you lead? Okay. Positive, for sure. We can do this. Can't give up. Relentless. Make it happen no matter what. Be good about stuff, you know, being on the ball and having deadlines and paying attention to them, making sure you're ordering things and coordinating things and so forth. Uh, and then a leader is always helping others see the positive side to help them believe in what they're doing is the, the mission's going to succeed. They will be um, successful. Um, uncertainty, I, I mentioned it a bunch of times. You just don't know what you don't know. A lot of things surprise. In the US, there's something called Murphy's Law. And Murphy, I guess, was a fellow who, um, if Murphy was on a team, the team would fail because Murphy was just bad luck. So uh, there's this, sometimes things have bad luck, but you don't give up. I, I look at uh, SpaceX, uh, they're in Texas. SpaceX is building rockets. And sometimes they have some amazing, beautiful, un, unbelievable landings. And lately, the last three have exploded. Elon Musk has not given up. No way. Three explosions, nobody's been killed, but they've lost a lot of money in equipment. But they're not giving up. Musk doesn't give up. He's a leader. Um, so you've got to acknowledge risk. You, you got to anticipate problems. You got to keep people motivated. Um, you're the one in charge. They look to you as leader. You need to be positive, convey that the team will succeed. Um, now, here's another thing. Engineers, whether or not you know it, the communication skills are important. You are going to give talks in front of groups of people from a couple to a hundred or who knows how many all the time, not once a year, not once every six months, all the time, daily, weekly, monthly. And you have to be able to give good talks. You have to motivate people. You have to be clear. You don't want to give them all the equations and stuff. You got to understand who your audience is. Um, I think analogies are pretty good. I like the ski analogy. I don't know if you do or not, but when I saw that slide, it wasn't mine. I stole it from someone else. Uh, I thought that's exactly it. You know, you don't learn to ski by reading a book. No way. And why should we think that engineering design, you learn, you read a book and, and boom, you're a designer. You're not. You got to do it. You got to build stuff. And when you do, some of the things you build are going to break or they're not going to work. And if that's it, you say, I, okay, I tried, forget it. Then you're not going to be a successful engineer. You got to be like, oh, that broke. How do I make that stronger? Or maybe I change the design. You're always thinking about how to change things for the better. You don't give up. You get things done. So um, this is the kind of the end of the talk. Uh, you guys are in different stages of your career. Some are just starting. Some are graduating seniors, some are going to grad school, some are getting their PhD, everything in between, maybe even some postdocs, young faculty. What, what's some good advice? I'd say, well, be on teams, do things with other people, join clubs, uh, competitions. I think competitions are great. Humans like to compete. And a competition that gives you a box and says, build the same thing everybody else is doing, that's not a real competition. A competition is like uh, going from Crete to Santorini. Nobody's ever done it. Can it be done? It's a 40, uh, a 50 foot or 50 foot and five seconds ascent with 250 pounds. Handheld 30 pound device. That's, that's a challenge. Nobody had ever done it before. The students did it. 
they decided to stick with it. They started a company. They're doing very well. Let's see, 2020, they 2005. They're 15 years out of, or maybe even 14 years out of being undergraduates. So what? They're the mid 30s, and they're running 200 person company. Amazing. So uh, internships. I don't know how strong Greek engineering schools are on internships, but Rice and Texas A&M. You want students in the summer not to go to the beach, not to work on their tan or, you know, work in a Tavana or something. Get a job with an engineering company or work in research at a university. Do that one year and then go work in industry the next year and potentially even join startups as, as a student. You, you work for the startup over the summer. So think about those things. They're important. So last slide. Um, engineering is, uh, I think, the best profession in the world, <laughs> biased, of course. Um, it's not just the technical stuff. I mean, I'll, for sure, you spend a lot of time studying for exams and working on things that are uh, very technical, very detailed, but that's, that's the foundation. On top of that comes the people part, the problem part, the society impact part. And you need to be the persons who are on the team. And over time, you become leaders of teams. And then you become leaders of maybe even companies. Um, I would say passion is important. Care about something. You put a lot of energy into it. And I think it's the active here. I talk about be, you know, be active. Be successful by being active. And that doesn't mean hanging back. It means engaging with others, taking risk, and so on. So thank you very much. And I, I, I hope that uh, this sort of was somewhat relevant to a new, uh, uh, a new dean, <laughs> uh, passed to the, the old dean to the new dean. Uh, these are some ideas. Maybe some of them resonate. Uh, probably some of them maybe are not appropriate yet, or maybe you've already done some of them. So uh, I'd be happy to take some questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, th thank you very much, Professor Thomas. That was an amazing talk, as always. And um, now, uh, because we have uh, a few seconds difference between the YouTube channel that the uh, talk is, is on, um, we will wait for the uh, questions because we have to type them in in the live chat. But um, um, if uh, Vasilis is okay with that, I can make uh, the first question. Um, when you started off as Dean of Engineering in RICE, how many departments did you start with and how uh, did you choose which department to found and why? Okay, um, that's a good question. When I started, there were six and um, six engineering departments. And I didn't really go in with the idea that I was gonna create part departments that sort of, um, kind of came naturally. Uh, one department was called mechanical engineering and material science, which is, you know, kind of two departments, but it was called one. They didn't have very many professors of material science. They didn't have very many professors overall. So there was nine mechanical engineering professors and I think five material science professors. And five professors can't cover a curriculum. Nine is not very easy. I mean, you got every, every semester you're teaching to maybe sometimes a little bit the freshmen, but for sure, sophomores, juniors, and seniors are taking multiple courses in the fall and in the spring. If you got five total people and you're teaching two sophomore courses, two junior courses, and two senior courses, minimum, that's six courses in one semester. You only got five people. That doesn't work. And if you wanted to do engineering design for freshmen, no way. So you need to grow the departments. So one way to do it was to split an existing department. The other thing was to recognize, for example, computer science has, has gone from being something that was fairly esoteric. And, you know, we, we as society sort of, you know, we knew a little bit about computers. I'm, I'm old enough to remember uh, when, when uh, you know, the uh, internet, uh, well, it wasn't internet then, it was a, a video game called Pong. 
It had two paddles and there was a ball that would go across the screen very slowly and you move the paddle and the paddle hit the ball and it went up and it hit the, the side and then it came down and the other paddle hit it and this paddle. And, you know, if you look at that now, you'd say, oh my God, that's, well, people actually played that. They were, they thought that was exciting. There were no explosions, no nothing, just two paddles and a ball. Um, that's where things began. So computer science um, and computer engineering, which are complementary, they, both of those, they're huge uh, activities now. So we, we have two departments in one, one computer science, one, one computer engineering that used to be sort of computer science. And then they, they split into two and they, they continue to grow. So part of it is what, you know, engineering is, is very much reflective on what society is doing. So it's not like the university sits there and says, okay, what, what should we do? Maybe if you're in the humanities, you might think about those things and because society is not telling you what to do. And society doesn't tell engineering what to do, but society brings up problems. Why do engineers care about sustainability? Because it's, it's important and you read about it and you see it. So it gets into influencing the curriculum. It's a... Uh, uh, I'd say engineering is open to ideas from the outside and it reacts to those ideas and say, how do we educate students to go out and solve those problems? And sometimes you have to create a new department. At a minimum, you always are changing the curriculum, updating the curriculum to reflect what needs to be done now. So in material science, for example, sustainability, how do you get materials uh, in a very uh, efficient way, mining and so forth is often very uh, energy intensive and sometimes polluting and so on. So you start rethinking how to do things because now the environment is so important. Um, anyway, uh, just recently in Texas, you probably heard about all the problems with our electric grid. It got cold and because the Texas utilities didn't insulate things because it, it's not supposed to get cold in Texas, but it did. Uh, pipes froze and uh, water and gas and things that were normally uh, delivered uh, or working didn't work. The power grid failed and people's homes uh, went, you know, they didn't have any kind of power, electrical or the gas, the gas lines, the natural gas was not there. And so the homes got cold and it was kind of a crisis. As a consequence, there's a whole bunch of engineers in Texas and other, and other places thinking, okay, we screwed up. We didn't uh, plan appropriately. Um, how do we prevent this from happening in the future? And it's not you know, writing some words on paper. It's doing things, it's building things, changing infrastructure. A second question that... Um... Uh, I have is uh, how much is your funding per year as a Dean of Engineering in order to face all the problems like recruit new faculty, uh, have money for undergrad uh, laboratories or um, to invite people to come over and for graduate laboratories, etc. Because I'm asking this question because in, <laughs> in our Greek reality, funding is very limited and um, uh, the Dean of Engineering and Vasilis can actually back me up on this is that they don't get any funding in order to um, have the ability to actually have a machine shop and uh, get the students to the machine shop in order to try and work on uh, new projects uh, or whatever. So if we want to uh, have our students to work on, 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 on a project, uh, we have to um, make them uh, or give them uh, probably from our own resources some money in order to, to get the appropriate consumables or small uh, stuff in order to, to create something new. So uh, seeing all that in your talk, it was amazing. And it shows how um, big the difference is between the, uh, the universities. Uh, but uh, the whole concept is actually to train our students in order to be ready when they get out there in, in, in the society to, to be leaders and uh, uh, try to, to get uh, jobs which will actually contribute uh, to the society. So uh, that's why I'm asking about the funding. It's not just, you know, to, 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 to sure, make the question. Sure. It's, it's a very crucial question for us. Yeah, well, my advice would be to involve industry. Mm -hmm. So um, 
the people, so I always think of a university as producing knowledge for sure. We, we publish papers, we write books, we're scholars. Uh, that's part of it. The other part is we produce people, students who are educated, students who are going to go work in society. And for engineering, there's companies that are gonna hire those students. And going to those companies and collaborating with them, making them partners, getting some money from them is very helpful uh, in going to the administration. So when I'm, a dean is in the middle of, of administration, the, the uh, provost is above the dean and in the US there's a president above the provost, then there's a board of trustees. Um, often on the board of trustees are alums from the university, most of which have made a lot of money that's why they've been selected to be on the board of trustees. They've been successful people. Um, many of them have made money uh, because they started businesses or they're leaders of existing businesses. Those businesses hire people from the university. And so they are receptive um, to uh, proposals from people like deans and department heads who say, you know, uh, I think it would be good if our students were better prepared in certain aspects of engineering that we currently do not adequately address. And they might say, well, what are you talking about? And you could use the example of design where you're trying to have students work in teams because nobody in industry works alone. They're always on teams, multiple teams usually. They have deadlines, they have schedules, they have to do things, they have to be ethical and have good integrity and so forth. All those things are true. I mean, industry wouldn't argue. In fact, most of those slides are probably um, uh, somewhat uh, imported from industry talks. There's, you go and type leadership on the internet, you'll find lots and lots of things coming out of industry. And those easily adapt to engineering. So. Uh, if you get a partner, if you are able to talk to a, a company who uh, benefits from hiring your engineers uh, and oftentimes through alums is a good way to do it. And somebody who graduated from Yoanina, who's, who's done well at the company, they would be someone to start with. They could bring in other key people and you say, all right, let's, let's start something small. And we, 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 we got to prove that this is a good idea. So let's, let's start with a small effort, but you put some resources together and then I'll go to the administration and I'll ask the administration for some money, but, and they're going to say no, cause I know that. And I say, yeah, but I asked for a million dollars. I don't want a million dollars. I need a million dollars, but I don't want a million dollars. And the guy's going to be like, what are you talking about? You want a million dollars, you're only asking, you know, you're asking for half a million dollars. And you say, because I already got the other half. The other half is coming from industry, from these graduates, from our university. And that's very politically effective. Because if you already have someone who's willing to put resources into something, and they're not even associated with the university, they see it as valuable. I mean, companies don't, you know, they don't throw money around for nothing. They, right. they see this as an investment in relationships that they're going to hire better engineers from your university than they would otherwise. And they will be a more successful company. And sometimes companies spend, you know, half a million dollars on an ad in a newspaper or a television commercial for 30 seconds. They're putting a half a million dollars into a university program and the other thing I always would ask for is I don't want just your money. I want a contact. I need liaison people. Right. I want to work on problems you care about. So tell me about some of your problems. What are things that you're interested in having students think about and faculty think about? And then I'll try to get some matching funds from the university and we'll do some experiments. That's another thing that's effective oftentimes is that usually like the Oshman Design Kitchen, it was an empty dining hall that nobody wanted. So you go to the administration, you say, we have some ideas. We'd like to build a machine shop. And they say, oh, well, we, we don't have any money for machine shops. You say, well, I'm not looking for money. I'm looking for a building. I'm getting a phone call. So let me get rid of that. Um, I'm looking for a building. And they're like, well, we're not going to build you a building. I said, I don't want to build a building. I just want a building. And they're like, well, we don't have any buildings. Yes, you do. You have this building and this building. These are empty. 
They have concrete floors. A dining hall was, was really a strong two-story concrete floor, just what you need for a, a maker space and, 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 and design. They couldn't say no. I mean, the thing was sitting empty. They, there was no way to defend not letting the engineering school take it over. Of course, the engineering school is going to have to raise the money to fix it. And da, 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 da. It didn't take a lot of fixing. I mean, and we don't, engineers don't care about elegance. We care about functionality, right? right. So, right. and then you go and you start bringing the industry guys in. You say, hey, see this building? We're going to have a machine shop here. And we want this and this and this. And then it's, it's sort of um, just snowballs. It, it, it becomes alive and people get excited about it. And at some point, you know, administrations spend money on certain things. Usually because, you know, some politics and, and pressure and so forth. This one is, is one in which you're not really using politics from, you know, national political figures. You're using people who are associated with companies who graduated from your university who want to help you train better engineers for the future so they can hire them so their company will be successful. They're not giving you a gift, throwing money away. They're investing. Right. Uh, and so I just wanted to tell you that um, we have uh, internship programs in our engineering schools and actually in the University of Fianna, there are uh, there is an internship program where different types of companies for different departments, uh, they have um, a, a, a specific number of open positions. And there, because there are too many students for the positions, uh, we have some criteria in order to, to have the students uh, go to companies and, and to see uh, the real life in a company. Uh, it's uh, a two-month uh, process and it can um, be done either during the summer, July and August, or during um, spring, and March and April. Uh, but now due to the pandemic, we don't have this uh, ability because uh, everybody is working from home. Yeah. Uh, so we do have this, uh, this uh, ability. And uh, what we're trying to do in our engineering school is actually to increase the number of companies that are included in this internship program. Um, uh, so uh, one uh, third question for me is um, um, I really liked um, your um, uh, point that you have to get departments to work together. So um, that means that um, except from being in a team in different projects, uh, do, did you, uh, during your um, time as Dean of Engineering in RISE, did you have people um, teaching in different departments, uh, some, let's say, mutual type of uh, classes? Yeah, um, the, good point. And uh, thank, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, a lot of times, uh, a design course should not be taught by a particular engineer because a particular engineer only knows what they know. And you need a sort of a team approach to uh, teaching. And it, there's also efficiencies when you get uh, different departments to work together, sometimes even different schools. Um, and you offer it, you, usually the thing to do is, I, I find that administrators generally are willing to do an experiment. So you, you say, this is an experiment. We, we're not gonna do this forever. We don't know if it's gonna work, but we wanna try. We think it will work. And we're gonna learn from the first time we do it, we'll do it better the second time. If it's valuable, we'll even want to do it more and more, and maybe it'll become permanent. But if it doesn't turn out to be a, a successful idea, we will stop doing it. The problem often with universities is the tendency to uh, only uh, allow things which become permanent. You say, all right, we're proposing this new change to the curriculum. We're going to do this next year and forever, and this is how it is. And that's how university people think. And that's not the way the world works, right? It, nothing is forever. And so uh, face that up front and say, okay, we are going to try an experiment. The first year we plan to do this and this, we will see how that goes. We will hopefully in the second year, expand the program, involve these other people and let it evolve. We really know that it's not gonna be the same three years from now, but we don't know what it's gonna be, but it's not gonna be the same, it's gonna change. And it's going to change in ways we don't know yet until we do the experiment. We get information and feedback. We take that. We think about it. We change what we're doing and de-emphasize some things and re-emphasize other things, include things that we're missing, 
and maybe drop things out that aren't very relevant, even though, you know, Ned thought that this was the most important thing and should go in the course. And okay, it did the first year. And then people said, you know, that's, that's just okay. These other things are more important. So we're going to change the curriculum and we're going to change the, the syllabus. And universities, oftentimes the, the model is a professor teaches a course forever. Right? It's their course, their lectures. They decide. They've decided a long time ago and be damned if they're going to change. And the reality of industry and so forth is things change all the time. You know, companies merge, companies go out of businesses, uh, accidents happen, uh, new, new things happen all the time. And companies are always reacting to changes. Uh, universities, much less so. And so I think a school of engineering can be in the forefront at a university for being open. I call them experiments where you, the, the dean or is talking to the provost and to the president saying, we're not sure this is going to work, but we want to try it. And we want some help from you. This isn't, you know, 100% financed by the president. In fact, if you can get 50% from someplace else, and it's always a good bargaining point. If I, I come to you and say, hey, we're going we're gonna to cook supper together. You bring half the food, I'll bring the other half. If I say, I, we're going to cook supper together, you bring all the food, <laughs> your reaction is, well, maybe not. You know, why, why would I want get, to get involved with you? Just to let you know, we have lots of uh, likes for your talk. Oh, okay. how many people? I was always curious if there's, um, if there's just the three of us. Or you know, it's, it's above 200. It's, more than 200. Uh, 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 more than 200 people. So, well done. All right. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, Vasilis, uh, do you have a question for Professor Thomas? Because I have a couple. Yes, here. okay. Uh, uh, while you select a couple of questions for Professor Thomas, mm -hmm. uh, let me start by thanking you, Apostolis, first, okay. for asking some of the questions I had. Okay. okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no problem. No problem at all. Um, and then um, let me thank you, Professor Thomas, for this inspiring talk. Um, I, too much food for thought, actually, for everybody. Um, I, I'm just going to make you, uh, I, I'm just going to give you one. A specific question. Um, our departments have gone recently through an accreditation process and the committee identified um, a course that is missing from the undergraduate program from all departments. <clears throat> and this course is um, the, the course you talked about in your talk, uh, engineering design or introduction to engineering, whatever it's called, for freshmen. So I would like to ask you, because we will start uh, implementing this soon, um, how do you design such a course? Especially, uh, uh, how do you design such a course if you have limited resources? And taking into account that uh, as a school, we get an average of about 400 students per year. Okay, and let, let's, so, some bookkeeping. So. Uh, it would be a one semester course, so you could teach it in the fall term and in the spring term. Uh, I guess we would start by one semester course. Okay. Fall term probably, or I don't know, yeah. So 400 students, okay. Uh, just doing the math, right? You got five days a week. Uh, so that, that's uh, 80, 80 people a day. Uh, you don't want 80 person teams, you want like five persons. I mean, a team, two is not a team, three is barely a team, four is a good team number, five's okay, six is getting a little crowded, 10 is nuts, you know, 10 people, three or four do the work and everybody else watches. So you need a, a number like around five. Uh, and so then you start doing the math. If you said 80 students and you got five on a team, you're talking about, um, 16 teams. Okay, so 16 teams of five, five days a week. So that's that's the logistics of it. So now you need a space that these plate, plate people can meet in. So you got to go find an old dining hall and convert it into this maker space, um, populate it with uh, equipment. And um, one of the things that is done is that uh, this 
design kitchen is not owned by any department. It's, it's the School of Engineering's design kitchen. All departments can participate there. Um, we continually look for equipment. Uh, one of the sources of equipment are used equipment that industry will give you. At least in the US, when they do that, they get a tax deduction. So instead of throwing away their old equipment, you say, give it to us. Um, and you know, machine, a lot of things in machine shops, lathes and so forth, are lathes will have a lifetime of you know 50 years or something. They don't wear out. So um, you can get older pieces of equipment, but you want some of the new cool things like 3D printers, which are getting less and less expensive. And generally there's you, know, you, you need to work the sort of pers personal thing about approaching alums. Uh, do they want to give cash? Do they want to give some cash and some equipment? Uh, I've also uh, had what we call, um, uh, we, 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 I don't know if the phrase works in Greece or not, but the kitchen is also a very uh, convenient spot for families to meet. They, they, you know, you sit down in the kitchen and oftentimes you, ha you share a meal in the kitchen. The dining room is more formal. The kitchen table is, is very informal. So we had uh, weekly meetings with industry called around the kitchen table. So we invited people to come in from industry and initially it's, you know, hard to do because they don't know what they're going to do and you don't even really know what's going to happen, but you get them at the table and you start talking about, you want to do some design stuff and you want to be realistic. You want real problems, but you don't have very much in the way of resources. What do they have that they might give away? And they go, oh, hmm, let me think. And every unit, every, every company somewhere, there's something broken that's been replaced and they haven't thrown it away yet. And so give it us, you know, and maybe one of the design projects would be to fix that piece of equipment. <laughs> and then the future years, you don't have to fix that equipment, you use that equipment, but you have to be inventive, right? And you, you need some cash, but you need pieces of equipment. And then these teams need problems. And I would say that's one of the challenges. Where do you find all these problems? Because I kept saying, don't give everybody the same problem. You might have three teams on one problem competing with different approaches to the problem. That's okay. But you don't want to have, you know, 16 teams doing the same thing. That's crazy, especially semester after semester after semester. Faculty like that, because once they get it set up, it's efficient. Yes. But students aren't going to like that. I say, wait a minute, we're doing the same thing that everybody's been doing forever. Well, this course sucks. <laughs> you don't want that, right? So then you have to have new things coming in, which means you need partners. You need people in industry who have problems. I usually would say something like, okay, you know, you're the, you're the director of engineering. You've got a stack of problems this high. The ones on top really matter. They're, that's what you're thinking about today. That's what you thought about when you drove over here. I don't want to work on those. Those are too valuable to you, probably proprietary and all kinds of things. How about a problem in here? You know, not right on the top, but one here that's important to you, but you're not getting to it. You know it's there and maybe you're going to get to it next year or the year after. Maybe it'll start climbing up in priority, but you just don't have the capacity to do it. But you know it's there. Give it to us. Let us work on it. And maybe also give us a liaison person someone from the company who can inform us about what really is this problem. How, because a lot of our things and our approaches, the company could say, that's been done. We tried that, doesn't work. That's been done. We tried that, doesn't work. That might work. Do you want to do that? We'll work with you on that, right? So the first year is hard. <laughs> it gets easier once you're successful. Um, in fact, once you're successful, sometimes the guys who are running the course have the problem of down selection. There's too many people coming with interesting problems that they'd like you to work on because you've generated a reputation that your students actually contribute useful stuff. And now they say, well, let's, let's get the university to work on this. These guys at Yonani, uh, Yonani, yeah. <laughs> I was Yonani. doing about uh, They're good. They solve our problems. We hire them. And, and then you get this feedback loop, right? So a lot of rice engineers, MIT engineers are out there. They're successful. And they're very happy to work with the university that they graduated from. And, you know, they don't know that there's 
needs. So part of the job is communicating and it takes a while. It might take you two years to, to before you're ready to launch the course. It's not one of those things, you know, usually a course at a university, some faculty member, you hire the new guy and the guy, new guy says, okay, I'm going to teach a course on, on polymer physics. And, and he does, boom, done. Uh, something like this is not, you're not going to hire one person and it's going to happen. It's, it's going to take a couple of years of planning and you want to involve the right people. Um, once it starts to kind of gel, there'll be people who will volunteer to get involved. They'll, they'll, they'll smell something and say, this, this is cool. I want to be part of this. So uh, it's hard to get started, but once it gets going, it takes off on its own. So I, I, I want to be a little bit positive to you, right? A lot of uncertainty. <laughs> You can do this. Thank you very much. So uh, there are um, many questions in uh, the chat. Uh, so I can uh, uh, maybe select a couple. Yeah, so. I will select uh, two or three if that's okay with you, Professor Thomas. Oh, sure. Yeah. So uh, I have uh, uh, questions from students which say, um, what, according to your experience, uh, advice would you give to young engineers so they can integrate smoothly into the world of industry, of real industry? Yeah, well, uh, that's a good question. Uh, something that shows the persons are thinking. Uh, I would say at every opportunity, the internships would be, you know, right, yes. right up uh, highest on my list. Uh, sometimes an internship it turns out to be informative in a way that you don't expect. Let's say somebody thinks they want to be a chemical engineer and they're thinking that they want to work in an oil refinery or something, and they take an, a summer job. And it's interesting, but at the end of the summer, they see what chemical engineers do in that petroleum uh, facility, and they decide, I don't want to do that. I want to be a chemical engineer, but I don't want to work. That doesn't appeal to me. And maybe they say, well, maybe I want to work in biomedical, or I want to work on something which has got to do with life sciences, completely different. So then following year, maybe you'd like to get an internship in some kind of a hospital or something, right? And mm -hmm. then you start to see things. Um, I think when you're young, you don't know a lot of things. And so you should try something. I, I, I use the word experiment. You know, an internship is an experiment. It doesn't have to be a commitment that you've decided that you're going to go work forever in the petroleum industry. Maybe you will, maybe you won't, but you'll find out stuff. And you'll even if the job turns out not to be very good, you will meet some experienced engineers. You will see people who know how to run teams, know how to communicate, know how to think on their feet. And that's good that you, you start picking up the skills that these people have. And maybe you don't join that particular company or that business, business or industry, but those skills are transferable to other uh, different uh, industries and different kinds of jobs. So internships are, are for sure. Um, I would say uh, network with people. Um, presumably, uh, when, when COVID and all this stuff is over, you're going to have lots of companies come to campus to recruit. And students should interview multiple com companies for sure. And if you can, you want to engage uh, with discussions. I, I always talk about networks. Uh, I think one of the things that I've been successful with is I know a lot of people who are really smart and get stuff done. And when I call them or I send them a text message, they respond. And oftentimes they can't do what I hope that they could do, but they know the person who can. And so now someone who I don't know, suddenly I'm connected with because of the person I do know, they have their own network and I have my network and the networks have networks. And if you're into one of these networks, you're in very good position to find out things fast, to learn about opportunities, to get information, to get resources. And uh, if you're, Google is useful, but people are more useful, right? I, I always talk about, you know, you can Google anything and the right answer is on page 19 at the bottom. And you only look at the first three or four things, which Google and its wonderful algorithm thinks is what you're actually interested in. And they turn out not to be most of the time. The real thing is on page 19, but you never wait to page 19. For me, I just pick up the phone and text somebody and say, somebody I know, how do I do this? And they say, I don't know, but you 
call Jane. She's, she's the world's expert. She's at Union Carbide. She knows how to do this. And if she doesn't know, she knows who at Union Carbide you can talk to and she will introduce you. So that's a very effective way of getting, getting things. Google's okay up to a point, but people are better. Okay. Uh, another question is, um, how well does the United States engineering to, uh, curriculum prepare students for the real world? And to combine it with another question is, uh, do you prepare your engineering students to take um, the engineering exams for, um, so do you address these aspects in the university level? Is it important for you? Um, sure. sure. You specific uh, so courses and stuff. Yeah, so accreditation is important. Engineers, especially civil engineers, when you build a bridge, it better not fall down because if it does, <laughs> uh, people die and uh, lawsuits and, and mayhem follow. So uh, engineers really need to know uh, how to do things 100% reliably. And so curriculum and what's covered is very important and accreditation is, is important to schools of engineering. Accreditation evolves. What is important is changing. So what the curriculum was for, I don't know, take, take uh, mechanical engineering or civil engineering, 50 years ago, what they learned in the curriculum is not the same as it is now. You know, in history, maybe it doesn't change very often. The, the curriculum is, is more or less fixed. Uh, engineering, the curriculum is dynamic. Or all kinds of new things. I mean, look at the you know the internet and um, machine learning, artificial intelligence. Even uh, my research group is now doing big data analysis. Using we we do a lot of electron microscopy and so on. We take images, and we used to be the one only ones that would look at those images. We are beginning to learn how to use machines to help us look at these images and learn more about that. So. Uh, computer science software applications have certainly been become huge impact in engineering. I don't think they matter that much, maybe, I don't know, but to poetry. <laughs> maybe I'm wrong, but, you know, poets get a different kind of education than engineers. Um, so it's, it's important to evolve the curriculum. It's important to be accredited. Uh, the uh, engineering, uh, professional engineers, the, the symbol PE in the U S yeah. means yes. you're certified as civil engineers, almost all of them become professional engineers. It's, it's so important because of what they, when they do surveying and when they do design architects, I'm sure it's the same. If you build, if you design a building and you aren't not keeping to codes or better than codes and something happens, uh, lawsuits and, uh, you know, that's, for sure, you, you have to have certified architects, certified civil engineers. Um, I think certification is fine, provided that it's dynamic, because if we were still using the certification test from 1950, no, <laughs> it'd be irrelevant. You know, it's, the world has changed. Engineering is a much more dynamic curriculum than almost anything I can think of. And so the same thing with accreditation, it changes all the time. Um, and what's accredited, you, you know, those accreditation boards need to be influenced by uh, people from universities and people from industry. Um, in a sense, engineering being a, a skill that impacts society, you might argue that engineers have more impact on society than, than anybody, really. They, they, um, if you took an I don't know, suppose you close down all the schools of engineering in the world, the world would be in trouble really quickly, right? Um, so if, if we didn't have poets, it would be terrible, but the world wouldn't close down. Uh, you know, certain things would be lost for sure. Poetry is important, but airplanes would still fly and, you know, bridges would still go up and down and ships would move. Um, I always sort of think of engineering as motion, taking energy and make things move, people and goods and right. so forth. And so energy, uh, en engineers do things. Things are impacted by engineering. It's not uh, a passive. So being constantly renewed is important. And I think most engineering schools, uh, they work hard to be accredited, but 
they also influence the accreditation board. A lot of times we introduce something new into the curriculum. And then after, if, if, if it's successful and it stays there, certainly uh, if it happens at places like Caltech and MIT and Princeton and Stanford, those schools of engineering influence other schools of engineering. So you have a good reputation. If you do something and it works, other people will copy you. Mm-hmm. And then pretty soon the accreditation people will say, yeah, you know, that should be in everyone's curriculum. They did it first. It was an experiment, but it was a good experiment, had a good outcome. They copied it. That worked. So now we're going to make sure everyone gets exposed to this. So it could be in a few years. It's not the case now in, in the United States. There is no requirement for design to be in the freshman year of engineering. Right. But I wouldn't be surprised that maybe within a decade, it's probably more or less happened already, but it hasn't been formalized. But at some point, the accreditation people will say, okay, well, uh, let's see, you do have design freshman year. Yes, of course. Uh, and, and it will be part of the accreditation process. It isn't yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if it, if it comes. So uh, just uh, 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 one last question, uh, which comes from uh, a former student of mine who is doing now his PhD in Sweden, actually. And he says, what do you think, according to your experience, since you did your PhD in materials engineering and you are in materials engineering departments, uh, what makes materials engineering special compared to other engineering fields? Yeah, okay. And uh, one last question for me is, which school is uh, your preferred one from the five that you've been to? <laughs> yeah, uh, okay. Well, we'll get, we'll get that out at the end then. Um, I think materials, uh, the reason I like material science and engineering is because it's got science and engineering. So I'm a good researcher and I like to discover new things. But I'm also uh, interested in in taking a new discovery and translating it into something useful for society. And I think that's what engineers, good engineers are able to look at discoveries and breakthroughs, uh, new concepts, and somehow say, well, how could I use that to make something better? So these days, uh, robots, uh, which you know, I think now we talk about swarms, little tiny robots, not one though, a thousand. And so uh, being able to carry out things where you've got this coordinated group of robots, they happen to be maybe flying robots. They're very small, they have sensors, they communicate to one another, and they can do things that you could never have dreamed about just a few years ago. And you know, those things go on first at universities and they quickly transition, usually through a startup. If you want to do something new and take risk, startups are the way to go. It's hard for General Motors uh, or General Electric or, you know, Exxon Mobil. These guys, they, they are innovative only when they have to be sort of things. Uh, uh, probably some people that work for Exxon Mobil would object, but the people who are really risk takers are the startups. And startups fail all the time. And, uh, but usually they learn a lot before they fail. And then they, a year later, there's a new direction and, an, and a new company. And you know some, some of them succeed and then they become very successful. Uh, and oftentimes <laughs> ExxonMobil buys them. <laughs> then, then they're part of ExxonMobil. So a lot of innovation that comes into big companies comes from acquiring small companies. And small companies, because they're small, they don't take a lot of capital and so forth. Um, you know, those four students from MIT, they, uh, they started a company. Uh, it was very risky. Uh, after a year or two, they started actually getting some good orders. Uh, there was investors that thought what they were doing was um, made sense. It might actually be successful. They raised more money. And uh, I, I was proudly watching this uh, group of, you know, they, they started the company, I think when they were 22 or something, right? So very inexperienced, bright eyed, bushy tailed, and didn't know what they were getting into, uh, and built a company that now is, is, you know, 14 years later, um, it's, uh, 200 people. And I, I remember talking to one of them, uh, uh, about a year ago, 
He said, we're very proud of the fact now we have more salespeople than engineers. <laughs> and but it means their product is, is, is really good and that they're out there. Um, the business part of the operation is now more numerous than engineering. I mean, if you have 200 engineers, you're not selling anything. You're going to eventually go out of business. If right. you have 100 engineers and 100 business uh, you know, sales guys that are out there coming back with orders and also coming back with problems that no one knows how to solve. And then you tell the engineering department, hey, you know, uh, I almost was able to sell our device, but the guys, they, they want it to do this and this. And our device does this, but it doesn't do this other thing. If we could do this other thing, they'll buy it. And all of a sudden the engineers go, yeah, we could do that. And next thing you know, you've got a new product that comes out, gets marketed, not only to that company that wanted it, but other companies. So now the last, the last part of that last question, What's the, the place I, I, you know, I'm, I'm currently at, at Texas A&M and I've only been there for a year, but my, my feelings towards the place is that I like the size. I like the attitude of it's sort of a can do, let's go, let's try it. Um, let's take some risk. And it reminds me a lot of MIT. And I think MIT is, of course, it, it is uh, world renowned and, and very special. Um, huge number of, of successful um, companies and, and people. Uh, I, I have a joke about MIT, you know, if football doesn't mean soccer in the US, it right, means right. You know, NFL and all that. And uh, a lot of schools uh, are very proud of their uh, football players and, and, and whatnot, and, and that's fine. Uh, MIT uh, doesn't play uh, varsity football, they, they have a club. And the club loses all the time because they don't recruit big, strong uh, football players. The, the people that play football at MIT do it because it's fun and, and they don't get scholarships. That... Yeah. And so MIT, I think since about 1940, MIT has won something like 79 football games. They probably wow. played a thousand and they've won 79. And you say, wow, that's pretty bad. And I don't know what the number is now, but a few years ago, they had 79 Nobel Prizes for okay. one university, 79. Okay. Now that was a few years ago. So now it's probably 80 something. So they can't win football games, but they can win Nobel Prizes. So it's, it's a choice sometimes. Do you, do you wanna be a school that has a lot of impact in um, you know, sports? and giant football stadiums. And that's not, there's nothing wrong with that. Texas A&M does a very good job with that. But the, the important ingredient to me is also to be entrepreneurial, innovative, impact the world, start companies, solve problems, um, get a reputation for, I think a lot of kids that go to Texas A&M and go to places like MIT and Stanford go there because they want to be involved in a curriculum that supports entrepreneurship. Right. So they want a good, strong business school. They want competitions. They want startups. They want that atmosphere of um, trying to change the world. And Cambridge, Massachusetts is just chock-a-block full of entrepreneurial things. Two of the, the COVID drugs, Mordana and Pfizer, those, those are in Cambridge. Right. right. MIT. Right. And so that's, that's no mistake that those, those places have people. And I'm sure, you know, they were working at this thing seven days a week, 24 hours a day. They, I'm sure they failed. It'd be interesting at some point, some, somebody will probably write books about how did they go from nothing to a, a vaccine in a really, really unbelievably short time. Right. And it, it wasn't just because of luck. It was working hard with teams of people who are coordinating, <laughs> talking honestly to each other, and you know, never giving up, just get it done. Uh, don't don't uh, ever quit. So, um, so I, I guess right now it's a tie. I'm excited about A and M because it's a new place for me. I feel some of the same kind of cultural things that they have a makerspace that at Texas A and M that would make the makerspace, I mean, it's probably 20 times the size of the makerspace uh, that we had at the kitchen. Uh, and, and they built a whole brand new building. And, you know, they don't have a, uh, a you know, group of 20 uh, 3D printers, 
I, I would joke, they have a, an Avogadro's number of printers. I mean, they're just <laughs> everywhere, right? Nice. And so a mole of, of, of printers, six times 10 to the 23rd 3D printers. That, that's the kind of thing. They scale it up. There's a lot of engineering students, about 25,000 engineering wow. students at Texas A&M, 25,000. MIT has 4,000 undergraduates and maybe 6,000 graduates. So about 10,000, which is a lot, right? But 25,000 is even more. So Amazing. anyway, it's, it's a new adventure for me. Well, we, I would like to thank you very much for this amazing talk, for uh, being so passionate, for giving us so much information. Uh, also, you can see additional questions in the chat, um, okay. uh, in the YouTube channel. Uh, thank you very much for accepting uh, this invitation. It was an honor and a pleasure to uh, have you online at least. Um, and listen to you and, uh, you know, discuss with you. It was amazing. Okay. Well, maybe the next thing I'll do is I'll, I'll fly into Crete sometime Please. and then I'll, I'll pick up the Daedalus and go up to... We'll Uyanina. See. Uyanina. Yanina is a lot more than 120 kilometers. Oh, yes, Crete. it is. Yeah. <laughs> we will make lots of stops, don't worry. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks a lot.